it's time for scribbling ideas. What's in your notebook? We have Joe Knowles, who writes children, writes for children and teens. Her newest book, Meant to Be, was a finalist for the Vermont Book Award. Um, we have Susan Tan, an award-winning author of the Scylla Lee Jenkins series, the Pets Rule series, and Ghosts, Toast, and Other Hazards. Chris Tevitz writes a lot of books on his own, like Me, Myself, and Him, and some books with other people, like James Patterson, with whom he writes the Middle School series. And finally, Linda Urban right here is an award-winning author of picture books, chapter books, and middle grade novels. Her latest is Weekends with Max and His Dad. You can find their full profiles in the program. Um, and they will be in the main reading room signing books and saying hi to people whenever they're not in here doing panels. Uh, if you would, please silence your cell phones. You guys can take it over. Fantastic. Yay, thanks for having us here. Um, so I'm going to step in and be the somewhat moderator, but really, each of us is really excited about this topic and the way that we use writing and drawing and notebooks and things that we can touch in order to help us write the books that we most want to write. So I wonder if you guys would be interested in introducing yourself, mentioning a book or two or whatever, and then maybe just how you use a notebook or paper or whatever. And would you mind starting, Susan? Oh, no, not okay. at all. Um, Hello, I, I, I'm Susan. I am really excited to talk about notebooks. I love notebooks. Um, so I write middle grade novels and early readers. Um, and I, I feel like maybe one thing I should say too, so I also am a professor at UMass Boston. And I say this because for me, writing has always happened like alongside my job. And that's actually how I wrote my entire first book is um, I wrote the first Scylla book when I was in grad school. And I like didn't think I was allowed to call myself a writer yet because I was like, I'm you know I'm just a fake poser, but you know da 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 blah 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 blah, and all of that was false. And if you write, you are a writer. Um, but I, you know that was the story I was telling myself. So what I would do is in grad school, like I would have the whole day, and you know I'd be really busy and like teaching and working and writing at the library and just being stressed, and then I wouldn't be able to sleep. So I started writing at night, and I began writing on my iPad, which like I know isn't a notebook, but was kind of like my first notebook in that it was just, like it wasn't for like official work, if that makes sense. Like it was, it was like an unofficial space. And I would lie down and I would, like I would get ready for bed, get into my pajamas, turn off the light, lie down, hold the iPad over my face, and type upside down with my thumbs. And I would do that every night. And some nights for like 10 minutes, and then I'd go to bed. Some nights for an hour, um, if I got really into it. And so that's actually how I wrote the entire first Scylla book, just on my iPad. And sometimes also on my phone when I was going, um, when I was on the bus. I would like type on my phone and look like I was paying Candy Crush. Um, but so I say that because like, I, I feel like now my notebook is kind of like that space for me you know this kind of it's like you can't check emails on your notebook you get you know i i it and and it also has become a place i think more playfully where i can both write and draw so like i am not an illustrator by any means um but i love to like doodle i don't know if you can see I have, this book is actually about, it, it's a new book I'm working on, tentatively called The Secret to Being a Rabbit. And true to name, there is in fact a rabbit. And whenever I get stuck, I doodle my rabbit and I make him saying something. And then I imagine what the main character would say in response and have the conversation over there. And most of it will never, never see the light of day. But it, it like, it's, it's this wonderful place for my brain to just have, have some fun. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't know if that answers your question, no, but awesome. I feel like that's, for me, notebooks are like a really a space to play and like just be creative. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in and practicer of, I come from a theater background, improvisation was a big part of my life as a theater artist, as a director, um, and then I read Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones, and I was like, oh, improv for writers. Um, and I'm a big believer in anything that I can do to get a different look at my story from as many different angles as possible, including getting tactile, because I'm a bit, I love keyboarding. I, I do most of my writing on the computer, but when I can do tactile things like make that uh, uh, bulletin board with the color-coded note cards yeah. or um, you know, sc scribble and draw and make maps of my locations and that sort of thing, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in um, getting out of my own way. I talk about, um, I talk about the way I 
uh, like to put on music and dance when I'm alone in my house. Not just because I love to dance, but because if there's any creative pursuit that I can find, and this is my recommendation for writers in general, if there's a creative pursuit that you can find where you are unattached to the outcome, like I am with dancing, and not being afraid of like, looking like an idiot, but also stumbling into some cool moves along the way, that's the first draft. That's the state of mind I try to bring to my first drafts, and so all of this I would call part of draft zero, as people call it. Um, and I'm also a big believer in inventing your own tools. I don't have a writer's notebook. I have an idea drawer. This is out of my <laughs> office here. Can I just, I, you know, I went and saw Kate Messner do a school visit when I was trying to learn to school do school visits, and she was like, I just always, I'm always, the radar's always on. I'm always stealing and snatching, and I sort of that always stuck to me, and so I have. 1,800 more ideas than I will ever write. Every time I think of something, I just keep these pads <laughs> all over the house, next to the bed, all of that. And I just scribble things down and I don't evaluate them. I just throw them in. And if I'm feeling stuck, then I go back to my idea drawer and I just start looking through. And, you know, I, I, I pulled a few from yesterday. Trying to stay soft in a hard world. Love I don't know. Um, is it diluted or not to harden up or is it the way? Um, Truth and or happiness. If you could only choose one, dot, dot, dot. So sometimes it's character stuff. I don't remember writing this one, but I'm very intrigued by it. I might use it. I have no idea how paranoid to be. <laughs> so again, like I will just start reading until something grabs me, whether that's to sort of spark the middle of my story where I'm stuck or spark a new idea. Um, and the, the trick for me is to not evaluate anything until I need to. That's awesome. Um, I feel like a late bloomer to the joy of having a notebook just for like notebook sake. Um, in the beginning when I first started writing, when I would finish a rough draft of a novel, I would then create a storyboard. Um, of the novel as a revision tool, and I have, so I can, I can, sh I can just hold it up, uh, what this looks like. So this is a notebook for my um, book, Where the Heart Is, and then it also ended up being a notebook for Meant to Be, which is a companion novel. But when I finish that first, what I call like a discovery draft, is I, I start to create, as I'm rereading my my um, draft, I create a storyboard. This is a method I learned from Carolyn Coleman, who I think was mentioned earlier today, too. She's like influenced a lot of us in different ways. Um, and so as I, uh, each of these little boxes rec represents a chapter in my book. And then, then as I, I also have a spread for each chapter where I'm taking notes, what characters appear in this chapter, what are the themes in the chapter, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see here, each time I go through, because there are many drafts, many revisions, I, I would change the color of my ink of what the notes I was taking so I could remember. Like, Okay, so um, what are the themes? What are the important details? What are some questions that I still need to sort of address that I haven't addressed yet? And, and in this case, I even drew like a little map of, of the character's house so I would be consistent in how I was describing where they were. Um, so that's what notebooks for me for like most of my 20 year writing career have been. They've just been like these tools, you know, that I use at a certain phase of my book writing. And um, I always felt like it was the big prize moment in the process of that story was when it, when I was ready to start a notebook and then start drawing the book because that's when it started to feel real to me. And so, but that's the only time I used a notebook or else when I went to a conference and I was taking notes on what smart people were saying about writing. <laughs> and, but then I would never really look at them again. And it wasn't until I, start, I was asked to start teaching writing at the Center for Cartoon Studies um, with an artist. So the two of us would teach together. I was teaching more of the storytelling side of it, and the, and the artist would teach a lot of the art side of it, but also the storytelling, because you tell stories through art. Um, and Glynis, my co-teacher, is here, and um, she really inspired me, too, because what was happening is we would assign um, you know, exercises to do during our workshop, and then everyone is drawing, and I felt so jealous. Like, I, I you know, I, I really don't like it when people say this, but I said it over and over again for years as I don't know how to draw, 
or I don't draw. And I think it, it's that moment for so many of us who grew up like in the 80s where it was like you got to take art class until about the third grade and then there was no more art. And so there was no more of that encouragement to draw. Unless you had, your teacher saw that you had talent and then you got to take the special art class, but no one saw that in me, so I stopped drawing. Um, but it, mm -hmm. so I remember in the first days, I was, I was saying, well, could you just teach me how to draw a dog? And I'll just draw, and so I have, I have a page of like a thousand dogs that I just kept trying to draw a dog, and even on the thousandth one, it still didn't really look like a dog. And I was, because I was trying to draw, at the time this was, I was co-teaching with Tilly Walden. Um, she, uh, she's, Tilly, she's Tilly Walden, she can draw a dog, and I was trying to draw Tilly's dog. But I can't draw Tilly's dog. I can only draw my own dog. And I don't even like to draw dogs. I like to draw cats. So <laughs> what I've decided is I've just discovered. So here's my first self-portrait. I've never shared this with anyone. Um, and the question is, so I start, when I hear questions like people ask, one of the questions I overheard was, how do you see yourself? So I write it down in my notebook. And then I'll just kind of, like, do I dare to write that? <laughs> so here is my. Um, how do I see myself awkwardly with cats? <laughs> but this joy that I have discovered um, from draw, allowing myself to draw my own work and not trying to be an artist or be like Tilly or somebody else or Glynis, um, just really having this sudden joy that I know my art will never be published and I don't care. And it's just the most freeing thing. So I wanted to sort of... Um, I guess say that through drawing you can discover stories even if you are not an artist and you're going to write these stories. I am finding all these story ideas by drawing. And so somebody once, I, a question I recently wrote down was, why is your roller derby named Lynx? And that is a really personal story of why I named myself that, um, playing roller derby. But I keep finding myself writing that question in my notebook, and now I know it's because that's a story I, I really need to tell somehow. I don't know how yet, but anyway, so uh, open yourself up to being an artist even though you have maybe told yourself you're not one. I have about, you know, you, maybe, you come to a panel and you say, here are the three things I'm going to say, and then you hear everybody else and you're like, here are the 37 things that I really <laughs> need to get out. So. Um, I'll try to narrow it back to three or four. Um, for me, I, I keep lots of different kinds of notebooks. And they are sort of an essential way of being, as well as writing for me. But this was not always the case. Because I was a kid who liked to read, many people would give me a blank journal when I was a kid, right? And it would be pretty, and it would have all this you know this, right? It would be leather, and it would be like, and you're like, this is where my brilliance will now you know, emerge, right? And you write, you know, I had, a, I had a diary in particular that I still remember. Um, and I got it at Christmas, but the first day in it was already numbered, was January 1st. So I had to wait a whole week before I could put anything in it, and I knew that whole week long that that was where my genius would emerge. And I was like, it was... It was January 1st, we had pizza. We watched the Super Bowl or whatever it was. Like, <laughs> that was the genius. And I went for like a whole week of that. And then I looked back and I was so disappointed that I was not, um, that, I, that my diary was not publishable, right? Like, because that's what I wanted. I wanted to have something worth saying that I could turn into a novel at nine and that everyone would want. Um, and, and that the notebook was, a, was now proof of disappointment. It was a proof of my failure. And that stayed with me for a really long time. In fact, it was not until I was like in my 30s, and once again I had a notebook, and I was like, this is the notebook. This is the notebook. And I wasn't writing for publication or anything. Oh, maybe I was by then, just starting to. Um, this is the notebook. And this one is going to be themed. This one will be all about our holiday celebration and all our tradition. And it will have recipes and it will have like what I want. It will be gorgeous. And I was, get, I was writing down what I was going to get my husband for Christmas. And I was going to get him some um, Hop and John, right? And it's, what's the name of, this, of the pizza place? 
something. Papa John's. Papa John's. And I wrote for Julio, Papa John's. <laughs> the wrong thing. I ruined the entire notebook in one line. And for the first time in my life, I crossed it out and I started again. And that was the notebook that stuck. After I was okay with it not being the thing, yeah. then it could be a place where I could play. And in, my notebooks still work that way for me as a writer. When I'm really writing my novel, I use a keyboard. When I'm messing around, it's paper and pencils and notebooks. And every once in a while, even the notebook will get a little too precious again. And then, I think I brought them. Yeah, and then index cards. Mm -hmm. And I think, Glimpse, do you use index cards for something? Would you mind saying what you use yours for? Um, I know I'm going to put you on the spot, but we have an expert here. Uh, hardly, no. Actually, um, James Sturm, at, um, who was my editor for a book on Charlotte Bronte, said, use these as, uh, you, you know, like a page and write what's going to happen on this page. Or, you know, like to... Like get 90 of them because that's the page limit, and I got 120 of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> Half of them out. I mean, like using them as, as either panels or as like thumbnails. Yeah. Did y'all hear that? Even in the back, were you able to hear? Like the idea was, you know, if you're going to have 90 pages or 100 pages in a project, that you started to hear. And this is disposable, which is awesome, right? But it's also small, and you don't have to, how much genius can you have, like on a note card, right? You can't put that much pressure on yourself. Um, I'll also just talk, have I over talked yet? Go. Okay, so um, I use them for various purposes. One thing that I think is great about a notebook for me is that it's a way for me to notice what I'm noticing. I use a lot of Linda Berry's techniques. One of the ones that she does is just a little diary where every day you write one thing you saw, one thing you tasted, one thing you touched, one thing you heard, and one thing you smelled. I have never been like a journaler or anything, but I can do that, right? And what I remember at the end of the day, those details, I start to train myself to pay attention. And when I'm paying attention to details in the world about my own life, it seems to translate into my fiction as well. Another thing I do, I also am not an artist, but the time that it takes, sorry, to write. So I did this when I was in England teaching this summer. I did one of these every day, one of these little sense diaries every day, and then I tried to doodle something. Sometimes I had to take a picture and work from the picture. But most of the time, if I could draw something, it meant that I sat there and I took the time and I found the details, and that focus on details mattered a lot. I have other ways that I use my notebooks, and we can talk about those. But um, as a group, we also decided that maybe we would share some of the things that work for us, and we could do it together in the room. Do you guys feel like you want to do that now? Sure. Good, so I'll put you on the spot. Who wants to go first? We all look at Chris. Okay. Because <laughs> you had you you great got ideas. Got yeah, you got us a Anybody need um, paper and pencil? Yeah. yeah. We got paper and pencil. And also, I'll just say while we're doing this, again, the cheapest mm -hmm. notebooks are sometimes the sure. ones that you don't care so much about, right? And that they can mess up. And I brought two. Who does not have a notebook or who wants one that they can mess up with right now? Yeah, you got your own these individual pieces. Mess that up. You got one. Anybody else want? Anybody want one? Yeah, you got it. Anybody want one of these for Chris? I use the moment inside to write down dreams. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and to write down writing, I just get from dreams. I'm sorry? Yeah. And also, Okay, so I mean, one of the things that I use uh, my notebook for is, as I said before, side writing, getting to know my characters, even just like one of the things I do most commonly, and that's not what we're going to do right now, is um, before I go to sleep, because I think that's a very creative mind space, or just after I wake up, I make a list of everything I know about the scene or the story that I'm working on. Just scribble, 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 um, which I don't even know why I'm mentioning that because, oh, because. Um, some of this, again, is about getting out of our own way and just sort of doing the first things that come to mind. And May, we've already done this in class, so it'll be repetitive for you. Uh, but um, you can choose, if you have a work in progress right now, you could choose your character or a supporting character. But I also think it can be valuable to start with one's self to sort of um, 
for me, you, you know, people, uh, we, we talk a lot about how we are not our characters. I'm a little bit of a, on the other side of that fence, which is to say we are kind of our characters too. Um, and what can I draw from myself? So use a uh, main character, a supporting character, or yourself. And the exercise is usually to write down 20 words or phrases that describe that character or yourself in any way you can think of. Um, you know, I'm a white gay man, I'm from Ohio, I'm a brother, I'm a husband, I'm a, um, a pickleball player, anything at all. I'm an impatient person. Um, and uh, like I said, usually we do 20, but I'm just going to give you one minute to scribble as many as okay. you can. Do you want me to do that? Uh, that's okay, I'll do it. Okay. Um, and go. There's more to this afterward. Up to yet. Take another 30 seconds here. Okay, wherever you are with your list now, um, one thing I do, if you are writing about a character and you're trying to get deeper inside that character, we're not gonna do this today, but my advice to writers is note the things about that character, the, the traits about that character that you share. Or if you've written a list about yourself, note the traits that uh, you share with, well, either way, uh, where, the, where the overlap might be, so that you can bring sort of a little more creative energy to the character if you start to identify uh, common ground with the character. Whatever it is you've done, the next step in the exercise for here today now is think about yourself, think about that character, start to think about what are the, the core traits of yourself or of that character relative to the story, relative to your life. And so take a quick another 30 seconds and cut your list in half. Keep half of the, uh, the most prominent characteristics on your list. So if you have 20, go down to 10. Circle 10 or put check marks or whatever. This isn't erasing the other things, it's just honing in on the most prominent. And when you're ready, take that 10 or however many you have now and cut it in half again and cut it in half again, noticing what drops away, noticing what stays until you have one, two or three core traits for this character or for yourself. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna assume that you're done. You can always continue this later. If this were a longer workshop, a couple things we might do would be to take one, or if you wanna challenge yourself, two or three of those traits, and write a scene with yourself or the character in that scene, displaying that characteristic without using the words on your list. Mm -hmm. it's just all, a lot of this is about sort of figuring out what's the core trait of my character, and then how does that externalize in story, through action, through interaction and dialogue, rather than telling the reader everything you wanna tell them about the character. 
Um, and that's the exercise. That's so cool. I was actually surprised at what I narrowed it down to. It wasn't the first thing that I thought I would keep. I love the surprises. Yeah, yeah. so good. Yeah. Susan or Joe? Um, yeah, or I could, I don't know if maybe it's better to just like tell tell you about it or? Whatever you want to do. Okay, yeah, or I could just do like a, a quick one or like tell you what I do. And if you want to do it as we go, you can. Let's do it. Um, so I don't know how many of you are American Girl doll fans. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I love the American Girl dolls. Um, I love their books and stories. And if you're not an American Girl fan, don't worry. Um, but like, so they, they all follow a pattern. So it's like, meet Samantha and you know it's about like you meet a character and see your home life and there's a small challenge like and and you kind of see a slice of life slice of life challenge and then this resolution and then there's you know Samantha's birthday or like birthday for Samantha and it's and that one is about like a party and usually there's some challenge running the party and like we, we follow a birthday things like that so the thing that I struggle with in writing is that, and my editor is always like, Susan, I know you love your characters, but they have to go through hard things. Because I think that's what happens. It's like, I love them. So I'll be like, I love Scylla so much. Like, I don't want her to be sad. And my editor is like, no, but there's no story if there's no conflict. <laughs> so she and I call it changes for blank. You know, so because, oh, so the final American Girl doll book is like the big challenge. So it's like changes for Samantha. And it's like, oh, we're getting older, and maybe, but there's also like some big challenge, like you have to surmount. So I call this changes for blank, and you put your character's name in the blank. And what you do, so I realized I should have like mapped it out. Sorry, you, this will be like a little hard to see, but so this is my, this is my current working notebook, which is my small notebook, so it's portable, but it's hard to see. So changes for blank, so you write your character's name. And then I have one column for character, where I would usually say like kind of, and actually you could even just like take what you just did with Chris's exercise, like write down just a few defining things that you know about your character, who they are, what they like, and you know, how, they, how they are in the world. So just to give you some examples, um, oh, now I'm trying, of course I'm blanking, like my character Mo in Ghost Toast and Other Hazards, for her it would be concerned with safety. Right, really caring, really protective, Contro likes to be in control, right? Knows a lot and is always like scanning the world to be like, I know that, I know that, I know that, I know what to do with that, right? Those would be some of the characters, character traits. In, the col in column two, and you'll see where this is going immediately, I like to put situations they would hate. So just like, like from big level to small level, right? Roller coasters, <laughs> my character would hate that. Right? It could be she would hate campfires. She hates fires. She hates kind of things that feel dangerous. Um, she would hate uh, she's she would hate uh, a really busy crowded cafeteria where she didn't know anyone. Does that make sense? So it's like just situations that would challenge them. And then of course in number three, I'd ask you to pick one trait and pick one sort of situation your character would hate and to write a scene in which your character is in the situation that they would hate displaying that trait. Nice. And that makes sense. So it's like, it's immediately like a conflict starter kit almost. Oh. So sort of, and using character, you know, one thing I think about a lot and struggle a lot with in my own writing is the idea of like, you want plot to happen, you know, and, and anything can happen in a plot, but oftentimes the most rewarding plots are the ones where to overcome the plot, the character has to also change and grow personally. And so for me, this is a way to like put my finger on, oh my gosh, like, and it can be really small, right? This character's nightmare would be the first day of a new school, right? And would be like, I don't know anyone. I don't know anything. I thought, and, and just to give you a sense of in Ghost Toast and Other Hazards, um, it's also like a really hippy dippy school based on where I went to middle school. So there are no doors on the classrooms and everything's a little loosey goosey. And she's like, I hate this. She's like, I like structure. I follow directions. I like to do my homework. What is this? Right. But so these are the ways that you can build conflict, even just a smaller scene, right? At a smaller level in the story. So that's, thank you so much for writing that down. That is exactly what it looks like. Yeah. 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 So that's my American Girl doll inspired uh, <laughs> notebook exercise that I like to 
do. I, I went to that middle school too. <laughs> you did, yeah. You know, all snow windows. No, yeah, you it's actually. Be different. You I, 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 okay. yeah. I was, I was. So I kind of already gave mine with the list, and I think Joe gave a little bit with um, how to storyboard. So we'd love to leave the last six minutes for questions if you have them. So what's on your mind if you listen to us talk about all these things, or what what can we answer for you, or what can you stump us? Or what on? tips do you have? Or for tips yeah. for us, yes. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um. So my struggle with journaling is I can't decide if I should have two notebooks, one for like writing, like you know, the, like what we've been talking about, and then one for sort of more personal journaling. Do you find that you have separate notebooks for that, or you only have one for writing, or you have one that's for both? I can answer yeah, that. that. No one is allowed to hold my journal <laughs> because I have really personal stuff in the back. Um, because for me, so like kind of Chris, what you were saying, like, and, and Joe, what you were saying too about, and I'm sorry, what, Linda, what you were saying, what you've all been saying about like playing, but also making mistakes and giving yourself permission. For me, if I have a proper notebook for everything, immediately it's too rigid. Like I just like to be able to have my feelings everywhere so like I literally and and um, I realized one thing I didn't mention but like one thing that might be useful I often do morning pages that um what is it called the writer Julia artist the artist way. Artist way. Artist way. yeah by Julie Julia Cameron. Cameron yeah thank you and um and so she suggests in the morning when you wake up just writing three pages and it can be anything. It can be, and it's unfiltered. No one will ever see it. So it's like a dream you had, how cranky you are, that you have to go to work, right? What the weather is like. Or like for me, it often I wake up with like feelings from the day before that are just really raw and kind of there and present. So I just say that because like I literally have my morning pages here. And then I also have like doodles of a rabbit further up. And then I also have like to-do lists further down. So. I, I think, especially if you're someone who maybe struggles with feeling like everything has to be perfect, I think it can actually be really liberating to just be like, I'm just going to be really messy. Like, and this is your, your space. Like, no one will ever know. No one will ever see it. So. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Also, um, what I've discovered now that I am now that like now I have a notebook is that the notebook that I have just for like that I take with me everywhere and I when I hear something I'll write it down. But I also I'm constantly writing down as I said earlier questions, but also questions about my character. So something that um, Kate Messner actually taught me um, eons ago was to ask your ask what your character wants, and it's like. To come up with a like really basic synopsis to tell people what your book is about, you're like, this is a story about a girl who wants fill in the blank, but underneath that, she really wants whatever. Um, and so I kind of took that and use it now with my students and with my own work to try to challenge myself to keep going under layer upon layer upon layer of. So like if you, just for an example, I always use this example, but like for Harry Potter, this is a story about a boy who wants to be a wizard. Okay, but underneath that, what does he really want? He wants to go to wizarding school so he can become a wizard. What does he want underneath that? Um, the more that you go, so like the overarching one is like what the plot of the book is. You know, you always have a character who wants something and usually that the thing is obvious and that's what the story is about and then the conflict is what's keeping them, what's keeping that character from getting it. And you might say, oh, well it's this evil, Wizard Voldemort who wants to destroy the wizarding world or whatever, but that's that's like the op Like the open part, but if you do what Kate suggests and ask underneath that so like um, What Harry really wants as you get to know the this series is he wants to have friends for the first time when you meet him He's utterly alone. He doesn't know anyone and then you get to know him a little more, and you realize this is a character who also wants to find his parents. And you think he's never actually experienced what it's like to have someone like treat him like a child and love him. And that's the key word is love. This is a story about a character who wants to feel loved. And that's that universal thing that all of us relate to, and that, I think, is why we like Harry. Um, because we know what it feels like to have that insecurity of questioning how lovable we really are. And so then what I've taken from Kate and expanded it to feed my own needs is I change the word want to fear. 
And that's what drives the emotional arc of the whole story is what is your character afraid of? And maybe at first, Harry is afraid he won't make any friends or he won't like fit in. And those are some valid fears that he has in the beginning of the story, right? But as you start to read further, you start to, he starts to have these deeper fears that drive the story forward and make it something you want to keep reading, which is like, what if I never find out who my parents were? What if I never am loved? What if I have to go back to this family that abuses me? What if, and all these what if questions that are all fueled by what he's afraid of. And that's what makes the story, gives the story depth. So I think if you're thinking about your own story, um, thinking about what your character wants, but underneath that, what do they want? And how is that tied to what they're afraid of? And they're almost always intricate, intricately tied. And almost always the thing that's keeping your character from getting what they want is this thing that they're also afraid of. So that's, that's why, so, so now I put those in my notebooks and I just randomly as I'm like, oh, I'm switching to this page, I'll come, why is your derby named Lynx? This is, it's a, an incredibly emotional thing, like I said earlier, and I keep seeing that page mm. as I go to just write notes for wherever, but I'm, it's, it keeps revisiting me, and I keep, and then I'll, I'll draw a little thing like, maybe I could write about this, you know, and then soon I'm adding all these notes in my notebook, which I never would have done in this formal notebook that was just for, you know, I even have the title of my book on my notebook. Um, and now I allow myself this freedom, this wonderful freedom to just write ideas and really explore these things. And it doesn't feel like I'm committing to it because it's not in the official notebook. Hmm. I, we're kind of done, but I'm going to answer Sorry. super. No, no, that's OK. Um, I think the answer is whatever serves you, yeah. right? So if it serves you to have a project notebook, which I usually do somewhere in the middle of the novel, a notebook for that novel appears because it's the tool I need. Most of the time, it's everything, because it, that's what stops it from being too precious. Mm -hmm. But I've also had a project journal. W when I was feeling like I wasn't making any pro pro ugh, progress on a project, I just started every morning you know, noting the date, the time, how many, I would later say how many words I had written, what I accomplished, what the <laughs> obstacles were, what my next actions were, and I was also trying to figure out under what conditions am I actually writing the best. And so I would write, what, are the, what did I call it? Conditions of creation or some stupid <laughs> thing like that. But it was helpful to me because I realized if I do the wood stove first in the morning and I nod up the newspaper, I'm reading the newspaper and it's harder for me to get in my story than it was before. And these are things I noted because I was paying attention to how I write. So whatever works, is how your notebook should work, right? We now have to go in the other room where all of our books are. So if you would like to um, have a book signed by any one of us, we'll all be in the other room. I think we'll also have our notebooks with us if you have questions or you want to see them. And just thank you so much for joining us to talk about this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Chris, thank you. I love you.